Welcome to chapter seven, and I seem to have discovered how I can use the PowerPoints for chapter nine. Now, I've also discovered there are a couple of mistakes here and there in those PowerPoints, but we'll get through it, and hopefully for the rest of the term, I'll be able to use the actual PowerPoints that go along with the book rather than using uh, edition seven and trying to modify it so that it fits what we're doing. I haven't been leading you astray, don't worry about that in any way, but uh, I think this will work a little bit better. I have added a couple of things that aren't in your textbook, however, so I'll try to highlight those. I'll try to let you know when I have done that along the way. But uh, without any further ado, uh, let me figure out how to share my screen here yet again. Um, by the way, the picture you may see behind me is of Jupiter, and this comes from one of our latest probes to that planet, the Juno probe. We'll talk a little bit about this when we get there in the later part of our lecture. Not the actual planet, by the way, but discussion of the planet. Uh, so let me figure out how to share a screen. I want to share this one here. Okay. Who can share? I can share. I don't know if you're seeing the dialog boxes that pop up when I'm doing this. Uh, so if I seem to be talking to myself, it's because I'm talking to myself here on uh, the computer uh, along the way. But here we are, ninth edition, yay! So it only took seven chapters to get the right PowerPoints along the way. Uh, this is an interesting photo. And this was a photo done in part by request from Carl Sagan, who was in the latter half of the 20th century, the most famous astronomer on the planet. Uh, most famous because he put together a spectacular show called Cosmos. And anyone who is my age who is doing this, which is teaching astronomy or doing astronomy, doing astrophysics, and quite a number of other sciences too, probably got their inspiration, at least in part, if not fully, from him and that show one of the persons who also got an inspiration from that show is Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is currently the most famous astronomer on the planet. And he's done a revised edition of Cosmos. But as the Voyager spacecraft were both launched in the 1970s and went by Voyager 1 and 2, Jupiter and Saturn, and then Voyager 1 headed out into far space, Voyager 2 continued on to Uranus and Neptune and then went out into far space. Uh, Carl Sagan asked if they could turn around and take a picture of Earth from that far distant vista, because we don't get out there very often. And right now, really, there are only those two probes plus the New Horizons probe that went out to Pluto that are still talking to us. There are a couple of others, a couple of pioneer spacecraft that are out there, but they've stopped communicating. Uh, but we don't get out there to see what's happening. So when you look at this photo, uh, what do you see? You basically see a dot. You see a very small dot in the midst of a band of light. That's sort of a light reflection that's coming across the, the camera lens there. We also see some pixelated stuff uh, that's uh, mostly camera noise, but there is gas and dust in our planetary system. If you are asked what color the planet is here. Some people often say white, some people say blue. Carl Sagan wrote a book called Pale Blue Dot. Guess what color he thought it was? And that title and uh, some of the themes in that book are inspired by our planetary voyages. So here we are viewed from afar. We live in a solar system. Uh, the word sol, S-O-L, is often used to denote our sun in the middle. Just so you know, this picture here is massively, massively, massively not to scale. Uh, you learned a little bit about scale when you were doing lab two, where you had to put the sun in one point and put all the planets out. You can see they're sort of stretching out a little bit, but the sun is like massively, massively larger than Jupiter. Uh, when, when we're talking about uh, how massive uh, the, the sun is, it's a hundred times more massive than Jupiter easily. So, so this is not to scale, but for you to see where things are, uh, we, it, it becomes uh, tricky. So we're gonna highlight some of these things. Our solar system has eight major planets. 
and we have other dwarf planets. Sorry, Pluto got demoted. I do belong to a Facebook group that's called When I Was Your Age, Pluto Was a Planet. Uh, my grandmother could have belonged to one that said When I Was Your Age, We Didn't Know Pluto Existed. It was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh. Uh, but we also have other dwarf planets, one which is closer to us in the asteroid belt named Ceres, and a few others that are out beyond Pluto. And we may have more in the near future as we discover newer and, and uh, a more distant things out there, but really relatively close to home because they're still in our solar system. All of the planets go around in the same plane. So if you think about our solar system as sort of being a vinyl record or a CD that goes around, uh, with a couple of exceptions, uh, they all go in the same direction, both in their spin and in going around the sun. They all go in the same direction around the sun. Uh, Pluto as a dwarf planet actually is a little bit off that record. Uh, if, if we sort of think about all of them going around like this, Pluto is actually at a 17 degree angle going up and down. That's another reason why it gets demoted uh, along the way. Uh, larger planets don't do that. Here we can see to scale, but this is to scale by size and not by distance because if this were the size of the sun, Jupiter would be out in the parking lot over there. Uh, there would be a lot of space between the, the inner planets and the outer planets, and the outer planets just get further and further and further out. You can see how tiny Pluto is. You can see how tiny Eris, which is another dwarf planet, is out there along the way. Notice we've got sunspots on the sun. Sunspots are larger sometimes than the smaller of our planets uh, along the way. So, so uh, these are our planets. Notice Jupiter is larger than all the other planets combined. Notice that Saturn looks like it's about the same size as Jupiter, but here's one of the things to keep in mind about that. When we're talking about sizes of planets, we can talk about how much stuff is in them, how much mass is made, they're made up of, or we can talk about how big they are, like if you're blowing up a balloon, how big it becomes. That's called the volume of the planet. Saturn and Jupiter are close in volume, but they are not close in mass. Jupiter is 318 times the mass of the Earth, so close is good in astronomy, so you can say 300 times. Saturn is 95 times the mass of the Earth, so close is good, you can say 100. So Jupiter is actually three times more massive, actually a little bit more than that, than Saturn but they look like they're about the same. Think about it in terms of like a suitcase. The suitcase is the same size whether you stuff it with feathers or stuff it with dumbbells. But if you pick up the dumbbell uh, suitcase, you're gonna feel how different it is from the feather suitcase. I often think of Jupiter as like the cannonball planet and Saturn as sort of a beach ball. It would literally float on water. It is that lacking in density. We'll see a little bit more about that here. This we've seen before, I think it was in chapter one or two. Uh, the distances, if we're sort of spreading things out, notice everything is clustered around the sun, but then we get further and further and further and further out as we go away from the sun. And we are at sort of one AU, remember an astronomical unit is one, and all of the inner planets are within two AUs. But then when we get to Jupiter, we're roughly five AUs. Saturn is 10 AUs. Uranus is 20 AUs. Neptune is 30 AUs. And Pluto actually varies a bit because sometimes Pluto is inside the orbit of Neptune. Another reason to get demoted. So when we're looking at the other planets, we are doing something called comparative planetology. What we wanna do when we do comparative planetology is we wanna learn more about the other planets so that we can understand more about our own planet and vice versa. We can see volcanoes, not just on Earth, but we can see extinct or dormant volcanoes on Mars. We can see field volcanoes, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the lava plains on the moon. We can see potential but we have never seen erupted, uh, erupting volcanoes on Venus. We have seen volcanoes erupt on Io. I'll show you a picture here in, in a moment. Some planets have atmospheres. 
We can look at weather patterns on those and see what's happening. Some planets have greenhouse effects, and we can see what happens when you have one. We have one. Whether or not you agree with climate change and all of that stuff, we have global warming. Uh, and and uh, it's a good thing, too. Otherwise, we might be stark cold. We need global warming. We don't need runaway global warming. We do need the greenhouse effect here. Runaway greenhouse effect is on Venus. Not enough greenhouse effect is on Mars. So we learn about these different kinds of things when we're looking at the other planets. But most things in our solar system is, in fact, the mass of the sun. 99.9% .9 of everything there is in our solar system is the sun or in the sun. So we are, in fact, the sun plus a little bit of debris on the side. Most of the sun is hydrogen and helium, H and HE, and it converts 4 million tons of material into energy each second. Inside is a fusion reaction taking place in the center, turning hydrogen into helium. And as that happens, it uses that fabulous equation by uh, uh, Albert Einstein, E equals mc squared. The C in that is the speed of light. So we're talking 186,000 miles per second, 300,000 kilometers per second. That's a big number, but when you square it, it becomes even larger. So you have only need a tiny amount of matter times C squared to give you a huge amount of energy. And we have a huge amount of matter being converted into energy each second in the sun. Uh, so we're not going to run out of solar energy anytime really soon. Uh, we've got another 7 billion years or so to go with that. So don't worry about using up the sun. The nearest planet to the sun is Mercury. If you look at Mercury and think you're looking at the moon, you can be forgiven. They're very similar on the surface. Inside, this is basically a big iron ball with a coating on it. Our moon, not so much iron. It's, it's mostly the coating. Uh, it is very hot and very cold. It has no greenhouse effect going on. That's why it, this happens. On the side that's facing the sun, 425 degrees, and that's Celsius. So we're talking seven, 800 degrees Fahrenheit there. That's really hot. On the dark side, it drops to minus 150 degrees Celsius. So we're talking about minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit easily. Uh, that is a big hot and cold difference. In fact, this is the biggest hot and cold difference of the planets. How can it be that cold up close to the sun? Well, that's because there's no atmosphere to distribute the heat around. So as the heat is absorbed by the planet on the sunlight side, as soon as that portion reaches the dark side, as the planet rotates around and it reaches night, it just radiates back into space. It doesn't stick around on the planet like our heat does because the atmosphere traps it. So a greenhouse effect is in fact a good thing in moderation. Venus, on the other hand, has a greenhouse effect gone awry. It's like it is even hotter than Mercury, even though it's further away from the sun, because in fact, the heat gets absorbed and trapped and hardly ever escapes. So it goes up to 470 degrees. This would melt lead on the surface. That presents a challenge when you want to send a metal spacecraft to land. How do you keep it from melting? Well, the answer is you really don't. Uh, but that's day and night, even on the nighttime side. It never cools off. Why? Because all that trapped heat stays trapped in it. And the weird thing is Venus actually reflects back like two-thirds to three-quarters of the sunlight that hits it. It has a very high albedo. Albedo is the fancy word for reflectivity of the light away. Our Earth reflects back, has an albedo of 25 to 35 percent. It varies because when we have more clouds or more ice caps, we reflect more. Uh, the Moon has an albedo, reflects back only about 11 to 12 uh, percent. Venus if it wasn't reflecting back as much, it would be baking even more and more and more. Uh, the size of Venus is about the same as the Earth. Uh, so, so when we're looking at twins of our planet in terms of size, this is it. We have actually landed a couple of probes on 
Venus over the course of the last 50 years. When we land probes on Mars, like the Curiosity rover or the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, they last for years and years, sometimes even decades. And we're thrilled because we actually send the rovers up and they're meant to last for 90 days or 180 days, and they last for 13 years. And we're like, oh, Venus, if it lasts for two hours, we're thrilled because most of them don't even make it two hours. That's because of the extreme conditions on the planet. We never see the surface of the planet from the outside. 100% chance of clouds, 100% of the time. On Earth, on the other hand, our clouds come and go, our ice caps come and go. We are the only place in the solar system where on the surface of the planet, we have water in any significant degree at what we call the triple point. We have it in solid, liquid, and gas. And right here in my own room, I have a water bottle that has a couple of pieces of ice in there. I don't know if you can hear them clinking around. Solid, the rest of the water is liquid, and there's water vapor in the air, gas. Right here, as I sit here, no special equipment needed to do that. We're the only place in the solar system where that happens. On Mars, we occasionally get a trickle, we think, on the surface, but it freezes or evaporates almost instantly when that happens. So we don't really have water. We certainly don't have oceans and lakes and streams and other kinds of things. We also have a pretty big moon. Now, there are moons larger than our moon, but they're around Jupiter. And when we look at a a moon this size around Jupiter, Jupiter is probably larger than this screen in comparison. So relative to the size of our planet, our moon is actually pretty big. Now this is to scale again by size. If the Earth were here, the moon would be maybe about three or four feet away. From there. So, so there's a lot of space actually between the Earth and the Moon. We get used to seeing pictures like this and we think the Moon is pretty close. It's a quarter of a million miles away. Then we have Mars. We tend to think of it as the twin of, of our planet, but in fact it's much smaller than our planet. Uh, and, and let me see here. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here for just a moment and see if I can find a picture that gives that indication um, here. Here we go. Uh, I'll lean back a little bit so you can see the Earth. Uh, over here is Venus, and over here is Mars. Notice that Venus is about the same size as the Earth. Notice Mars is much smaller than the Earth. Mars is larger than the moon, but it is significantly smaller than the Earth. So when we're talking about twins, Venus is more the twin of our planet than Mars is in overall size comparison, but Mars's surface looks more like the twin of our planet. Uh, so let me go back to uh, sharing the PowerPoint. Uh, there we go, back again. Mars has volcanoes. These little things on the side here are part of the volcanic plain. Just beyond this picture, we have Olympus Mons, Mount Olympus, the largest volcano in the solar system. If you've seen Total Recall, it features the, the, the uh, old version with Arnold Schwarzenegger. But these volcanoes are now pretty much extinct. We can say dormant because it's a very, very minute possibility. There might still be something rumbling there, but they haven't erupted in millions of years, perhaps even billions of years. We have this huge canyon here. Uh, lest we think it's like the Grand Canyon, if you put the map of the United States here, LA and San Francisco would be over here. New York City and Washington DC would be over here. This is thousands of miles long, so it's not the Grand Canyon. It's much, much bigger. And this was a lava tube. We also have some smooth plains and areas where it looks like we've had river flows and lake beds, so we're pretty convinced that there was water on the surface in significant portions at some point in Mars's past. And as we look more specifically at Mars in a later lecture, we'll talk about why it's not there anymore. 
Then we have our outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. It's only Uranus when you're on the Bob and Tom show. Uh, it's Uranus otherwise along the way. We sometimes divide these into gas giants or, and ice giants. That always reminds me of Game of Thrones or something like that. But in fact, we can also just call all four of them gas giants. They're all made of gas. They're not solid on the surface the way the Earth is and the way the other terrestrial planets are. Jupiter, also mostly H and HE. What else was H and HE? The sun, you're right. Uh, so hydrogen and helium here. This is not a, a, a protostar. This is not like if you had an extra bucket of hydrogen and threw it on there, it would turn into a star. We'd need about nine more Jupiters glomming together. Uh, the process is called accretion, accreting on and becoming a much larger thing before it would ignite into a star. So it's not likely to happen anytime soon. 300 times as massive as the Earth, but if it were hollowed out as like a, a gumball machine and we put Earth-sized gumballs inside, we could put more than 1,200 inside. Uh, so when we're talking about size, remember there's volume and there's mass. It has lots of moons. In fact, uh, Saturn and Jupiter keep competing with each other for more and more and more moons. Uh, because we keep finding more and more and more moons. When I took Astronomy 101, I was very proud of myself when I went into class and I'd memorized all 12 names of the Jupiter, of the Jupiter satellites, of the Jupiter moons. And then I found out there were 14. Well, there are over 70 now, perhaps as many as 80. Uh, Saturn is up to more than 100. So we also just barely knew when I took this class, that there were rings around Jupiter, because those rings aren't big, white, fluffy snowball rings. They're more charcoal-y, dark material rings. So most of the pictures we have of Jupiter don't seem to show the rings. When we look at Jupiter, it looks like a miniature solar system. It has many moons going around it. And the four major ones, you can actually see with low-powered binoculars or telescope. You have 10 by 50 binoculars. Don't even have to go break the bank. 1995, Celestron, Mead, Orion, they're all good uh, 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 brands. But if you have 10 by 50 binoculars and you look at Jupiter, you will have a better telescope than Galileo started out with. We call these Galilean moons because he's the first guy to look through the telescope and see them. And the four main moons are Io, which has active volcanoes. It's the other place in our solar system that has active geological volcanoes. And pretty much every picture we've ever taken of Io has a volcano erupting somewhere or a lava plain flowing somewhere on the surface. Europa is another one. In fact, that is going to be one of the signature NASA events of the next 25 to 30 years. Uh, so stay tuned and watch. We're hoping to launch a probe, land on the surface, and drill down to see if we can find anything embedded in the ice because it's an ice ball, but under the ice is a liquid ocean. And that liquid ocean might have life. Could be interesting. Ganymede also seems to have some subsurface water stuff going on. Uh, nothing on the surface, but some subsurface things. It's the largest moon in the solar system. And Callisto is a great big ice ball. It may be the largest comet ever to come into the solar system and maybe got caught by Jupiter's gravity. Most of these moons were probably uh, uh, either formed with Jupiter or caught early in their, their uh, uh, range as Jupiter was forming. Jupiter continues to catch some comets. We have had collisions that we've seen, Shoemaker Levy 9. Also, it catches other asteroids and comets and turns them into moons, but sometimes they don't last, especially if they're caught going the other direction. We call that retrograde. So when something is going in retrograde, it's it's usually not terribly stable, especially if everything else is going the right way. And Thus, they disintegrate sometimes. That helps feed the ring system along the way. Sometimes they crash into other moons. Sometimes they crash into the planet. Uh, so that's another reason why the number of moons around Jupiter and Saturn and the other planets uh, in the outer solar system, but primarily Jupiter and Saturn, can be variable. 
Saturn, of course, is Lord of the Rings. Ta-da, here it is. And the rings are spectacular because they are highly reflective, that albedo word again. Uh, they are mostly snowballs, a lot of H2O there. It has a bunch of moons, including this interesting one called Titan. Titan is a moon that is, we'll, we'll say, sort of moon size, uh, the size of our moon rather than asteroid tiny size. It's the only moon with a significant atmosphere. And we've actually landed a probe on Titan. When we sent the Cassini probe up to Saturn, it went around for more than a dozen years. It actually had a backpack on it called Huygens, named for an astronomer named Christian Huygens, who lived right after Galileo. And it landed on the surface, and it found lakes and streams and falls and clouds. And I just said a moment ago, there's nowhere that has water on the surface that's liquid in the solar system. And I was right because that liquid is not H2O. That liquid is really, really cold, but not cold enough to freeze methane and ethane. So it's an interesting place. When we look at the rings, we can even look from behind and see the reflectivity here. Where This is a, a Cassini uh, photograph. Cassini was in orbit for a long time, took hundreds of thousands of images. And one of the things that we see is that the rings are highly structured, and we'll see more about this as we look at it. Each snowball could be its own tiny moon. Where do we make the distinction between how large or how small something has to be a moon? Oh, that's, that's a question too. So then we have Uranus. Uranus is interesting for one major reason. It is on its side as it's going around. So all the other planets are sort of going around like this, and Uranus is going on its side. Another planet that's interesting over here, Venus, is actually upside down as it's going around. Those are two of the big exceptions in our solar system, and both of them have to do with impacts. At some point, something came along and hit Venus and tipped it upside down. Something came along early in our solar system and hit Uranus, but Uranus is gas. So it didn't tip it the same way Venus, which is solid, did. It unswirled it, and when it swirled back under gravity, it swirled back on its side, and it rolls along. Mostly hydrogen and helium. Smaller than Jupiter. Remember, Jupiter is 318 times the size of the Earth. Uranus is about 15 times, so significantly smaller than Jupiter, significantly larger than us, though. But it also has some other compounds in there in a higher relative abundance than Jupiter uh, of H2O, you know, water, gas. Uh, this here is ammonia, and then we have methane and ethane again. It is extreme axis tilt, so when we're looking at the rings, we see here they look like they're on the side. That's because the planet itself is on the side going around like that. It has a bunch of moons, but it is the one outer planet that doesn't have a major moon. Saturn has a major moon, Titan. Neptune has a major moon, Triton. Jupiter has four major moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Uranus was off getting its hair done on its side when they were handing out the moons. Uh, so, so, so it didn't get that. But Uranus is perhaps one of the coldest places in our solar system. It is a frozen snowball. It looks significantly colder. It looks like a frozen version of Neptune. Even though Neptune is further away, Neptune is tilted the way the Earth is tilted. See, Venus is sort of straight up and down, but it's upside down. Earth is tilted, Mars is tilted, Jupiter is straight up and down, sort of oriented the way that, that we think it should be in the normal way. Uh, Uranus is on its side, Neptune is tilted. Any planet with a tilt, remember, has seasons. So Neptune has seasons. But it takes a long, long time, more than 160 years, for Neptune to go around the sun. So each season lasts about 40 years, 41 years or so. It has a bunch of moons, including Triton. Triton is interesting because, hey, we've got that retrograde thing going again. Triton is going in the wrong direction. That means it's somewhat unstable. And right now there's a debate among astronomers, is it actually spiraling into the planet eventually will crash in? Or is it in fact spiraling away from the planet and will go out? 
uh, we're not sure which of those will happen. So if it spirals in, it'll reach a certain point where it begins to crumble and shatter away. But the fact that it's going in the wrong direction says it's been captured from somewhere else. It has a very, very thin, Triton has a very, very thin atmosphere. So when I mentioned Titan having the only major atmosphere for a moon, that's because Triton has an incredibly thin atmosphere, probably had more at an earlier point. When we look at Neptune in more detail, we'll talk about that. Then we have our dwarf planets, Pluto, Eris, and Sedna, and Maki Maki, and Haumea, and others that we keep finding out there, not all of which have been classified as dwarf planets yet, but stay tuned. Uh, Pluto was discovered in 1930. They were looking for something that they thought was giving a little bit of a tug on Uranus and Neptune's orbit. Uh, they happened to be looking, a guy named Clyde Tombaugh happened to be looking in the right place at the right time at the Percival Lowell Observatory. He discovered this. It didn't quite fit the pattern of what would be tugging on Uranus and Neptune to sort of pull them off, off side. But it was interesting nonetheless. It is much more like a comet than it is like a planet but we have had a probe go to it as well. We've had probes go to all of the planets, all eight major planets and Pluto. The planning for the Pluto mission was done while it was still classified as a planet. Uh, so so that's, that's a sort of interesting thing that's there too. This is a close-up picture. This is in fact not in your, um, in, in your uh, 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 textbook, I believe, but this is something I pulled from outside. Uh, when we got there in 2015, uh, we needed to be there because winter was coming. This is the Game of Thrones planet. And when winter comes on Pluto, it lasts 150 years. And it's a global thing because it goes far away from the sun and then comes back in. It's the only planet that goes significantly farther away and significantly closer for the seasons along the way. Uh, so, so we have these different structures that are there, and we'll talk about what those are in much more detail, as well as the New Horizons probe when we look at that. But here's a handy dandy chart. Uh, you can see the relative size in this sort of uh, third column here. Notice how much larger Jupiter is uh, than the others. Notice how much smaller Pluto and Eris basically disappear. We can sort of see how far from the sun things are. And we have 5, 10, 20, 30. Remember, close is good in astronomy. Uh, for, for the average distances, average means sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's further away. Nothing goes around in a perfect circle. Remember Kepler, nothing goes around in a perfect circle. When we're looking at the masses here, again, Jupiter 318 times, uh, Earth is 1. Uh, so it's 318 Earths. Uh, Saturn is 95 Earths. Notice Mars here, 0.11. So it's only 11% the size of the Earth in terms of mass. Uh, Venus is 82%. So again, when we're looking for twin planets, Venus in its structure is closer to that. Now, one of the things I want you to notice in particular, orbital period, that means how long is the year? Notice our year is one year. Mars is almost two years. Uh, Mercury whips around in 88 days. Uh, Venus is going around in about eight months or so. But by the time we get out to Jupiter, it's 12 years. Saturn is 30 years. Uranus is 84 years. Neptune is 165 years. Pluto is 250 years. So, so see, it gets longer and longer and longer. But a, here, rotation period, that's how long a day is. We've got 23 hours and 56 minutes. Uh, this is how long it takes to go around. So if I'm looking at this and it's spinning around, if this were the Earth, you're, you're asking the question, why isn't it 24? Well, it's 24 relative the, to the sun, because remember, as it's going around, it's also moving. And it has to get back relative to the sun over here. That's where that extra four minutes comes from. But just on its own, on its axis, we're at 23 hours and 56 minutes. So we're a little bit under 24. Mars is a little bit over 24. But notice a couple of things. Jupiter is whipping around here in under 10 hours, 318 times the size of the Earth, and it's whipping around in under 10 hours. 
Saturn is 95 times the Earth, and it's whipping around in just over 10 hours. So these are really, really fast. Look here at Venus. What's going on there? 243 days. One day on Venus is 243 Earth days. A year on Venus is 225 Earth days. A day on Venus is longer than a year on Venus. That's a weird thing. And that's because Venus is upside down. It's upside down, which means it's rotating in the wrong direction. So whatever came along and hit it stole most of its rotational energy. And because it's going against the grain of the rest of the solar system, it's just dragging there. So it's really, really bizarre. So those are some things to highlight, some things to look at. Then we have our surface temperatures. These are in Kelvin. Uh, so, so when we're talking about 290 Kelvin, remember minus 273 Celsius is absolute zero. Uh, so this is sort of where we are uh, when we're looking at Mars. Uh, this in Kelvin, we're, we're talking about maybe minus 50 to minus 100 degrees uh, uh, as regular sort of temperatures on, on Mars in Fahrenheit. But there are some days that actually get up to a balmy 40, 50, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But here's the thing, there's not enough atmosphere there to lock the heat in. So, and there's not enough atmosphere for you to breathe. You couldn't go outside into it either. Notice Venus here, really, really hot. I mean, that's, that's, that's really smoking there. And then, of course, we've got colder and colder and colder and colder as we go further and further out into the solar system. These numbers here for the moons, uh, always look them up because this number is now over 100. I always go to the NASA website uh, for the latest updates of numbers uh, on these. And this 79 here, you go to the NASA website and you'll see that some of them have an asterisk because we're not sure how many of them are falling in to become lunch, and how many of them might escape along the way. So when we're looking at all these different features, we look to see what's happening and how things formed. One of the things we notice is that things are pretty much going in the same direction. The sun is spinning. All of the planets are spinning around the sun in the same direction as the sun is spinning. And they're all rotating in the same direction as the sun is spinning and as they're going. The two exceptions to that are Venus, upside down, spinning in the other direction. It's still going in the right direction around the sun, but it's spinning on its axis in what we would call retrograde, the wrong way. And Uranus is on its side. Both of those can be explained through an impact happening at some point. When we see differences in things, we want to be able to explain them. We've got two types of planets. We've got terrestrial planets. Terra is a Latin word for Earth, so Earth-like planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Jovian planets, four of those, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Jove is another word for Jupiter. Uh, so the gas giant planets are far away from the sun. They're out beyond where the sun would cause them to melt or boil away. The terrestrial planets are in closer to the sun. They are made of rock and metal that doesn't tend to boil away or bubble away. So these are some comparisons, smaller and larger. Higher average density, because rock weighs more than gases. Mostly made of rocks and metals, mostly made of hydrogen and uh, helium. Solid surfaces versus no solid surfaces. Not so many moons or rings, lots of moons and everyone has rings out there. Closer to the sun, farther to the sun. So this is basic comparison that you can do for those planets. And then we have other things that are out there. Asteroids, most of which live between Jupiter and Mars, but we have some that come in closer to the sun, some that are scattered throughout the solar system. Some get caught in the gravity of other planets and they become moons or they become lunch. Sometimes they crash in. We've had asteroids hit our planet before, sometimes significantly, the death of the dinosaurs, for example. Comets come from way out 
in the outer portion of the solar system where they stay mostly frozen. They only grow tails when they come in closer to the sun, and we'll talk a lot more significantly about that. There are two main regions for comets. We have a Kuiper belt, which is sort of in the same plane as all the planets, but it's out further beyond Pluto. And then we have this huge area that surrounds the entire solar system, 360 degrees, like we're living in the middle of a snow globe, called the Oort cloud. And it can have trillions of comets out there. So we have actually landed on asteroids and comets. Uh, one of the more adventurous missions was the Rosetta mission to cheryumov Garamasinko which is hard to say, so most people call it Comet 67P. And one of the things that happened here is the Rosetta spacecraft went into orbit while it had a backpack, see we do that a lot, uh, uh, called the Philae lander, and it landed on the surface and sent us back data. Didn't last for very long because when it got on the surface, it bounced. We didn't realize, hey, if there's no gravity, there's nothing to hold it on. On, onto the surface, so it bounced into a shady area and couldn't get solar power. But one of the things you notice here is it, as it's getting closer to the sun, it's beginning to glow and melt. So it, it was a really interesting mission. We'll talk more about this later in the semester. So I've talked about the, the, the exceptions here. Venus's spin, its rotation, is opposite. So we say it's upside down. Uranus is at a 90 degree tilt. Note, note, note. I am using this here for this uh, uh, video. Your PowerPoint, if you download it, says Neptune here. That was a typo. It's Uranus that's on its side. Remember that. So when you get uh, you, your download from, from uh, the, the uh, Mastering Astronomy, go in and change that for yourself. Now, one of the things your chapter also covers is how do we learn the scale of the solar system? We can do this in interesting ways, and we have sometimes, because we're third planet from the sun, third rock from the sun, if you've ever seen that show, it was pretty cool. There are two planets between us and the sun, Mercury and Venus. Both of them will occasionally go in directly in front of the sun so that we can see it sort of crossing. That's called a transit. Mercury does it on a, on a reasonably regular basis. Venus can sometimes take quite a while. Uh, uh, doesn't happen in every lifetime, actually, along the way. But at one point, there was a mission, and this was hundreds of years ago, So, but this was a very inventive mission, where they sent observers to near the North Pole and near the South Pole. They sent off ships to view the transit of Venus as it went across the sun. Because if you're up at the North Pole and you're looking at Venus, it goes across the sun at a lower spot than if you're looking from the South Pole going at where Venus's shadow would be going across the top here. So it's, it's sort of interesting because what you can do is you can measure the distance on Earth between where you're looking, North Pole and South Pole. We can measure that distance here on Earth. We don't have to speculate out there. Now, that forms a triangle. Notice we have this triangle with, from North to Venus to South. There are three sides there. You can divide that triangle in two by just putting this extra line there. And when you do that, it makes two triangles that are both right triangles. A right triangle has 90 degrees. So a flat line is 180 degrees. Put a line right in the middle, and you've got two 90-degree angles. That's what's happening here. So now you know you have a 90-degree angle. And now you know the distance, too, because you already knew the distance from north to south, so it's only half that. Now, here's the good thing about trigonometry, and I will not make you do this. I don't expect you to do this, but just be aware that this is how it happens. In trigonometry, if you know one angle and one side, you can figure out the other two angles and the other two sides. So we now have one angle, 90 degrees, and one side. We can figure out, oh, how long is that? How long is that? We can also tell that these triangles over here will be complementary, they will be reflective of the triangles over here. So we can use this 
to measure what's happening in our inner solar system. No spacecraft required. We actually did a pretty good job uh, at, at that. The people doing it got close enough that they'd get an A. But we now send, of course, spacecraft out to do spectacular missions. For a long time, a lot of them were flybys. Uh, what that means is they don't land, they don't even stop and go into orbit, they just on their way. It's like, okay, we're not stopping kids, just take your pictures. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, both were flyby missions. Voyager 1 went to Jupiter, Saturn and out into the solar system. Voyager 2 went to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, as you see here in our uh, PowerPoint. Uh, it was the only spacecraft so far to ever go to Uranus and Neptune. Look how long it took. We launched it in 1997 or 1977, and it took until 1989 to make it all the way out to Neptune. So that's a long, long way to go. That's why we don't send missions out here very often, because it takes so long to get out there. We can get to the moon in a couple of days. In fact, now we can get there in, in less than two days. But to get to Jupiter takes at least a year to a year and a half. And to get any further out takes longer and longer and longer the further out we're going along the way. But these are cheaper missions because you essentially have a camera and other sensors. Uh, and you're just sort of taking pictures as you're coming close to it, then you angle yourself away, take pictures as you're going away from it. And that was what we did. We had Pioneer spacecraft, Pioneer 10 and 11 went out to Jupiter and Saturn, then followed on fairly quickly with Voyager 1 and 2. We've sent the Galileo probe up to Jupiter since then to go into orbit. And then after it, uh, its mission ended, we sent the Juno probe, which is up there right now, and that's what this picture is. This picture is also not in your textbook. I pulled it off of the NASA website. Uh, and, and the advantage of that is you can keep going around and around and around and around for years and take more and more and more pictures, more and more data, more and more readings, uh, whereas if you're just doing a flyby, you're sort of stuck with just what's happening there, which was great because that was much better than anything else we could do before we got orbiters. Uh, but we've had the Galileo orbiter and the Juno orbiter around uh, Jupiter. We've had the Cassini orbiter for more than a dozen years around Saturn. Uh, so so we, 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 we are good at this. Again, we haven't sent anything else out to Uranus and Neptune. So uh, one of the things in the long-range NASA plans and long-range ESA plans are that we hope to have things that we might be able to send out there that can go into orbit for a couple of years and take some readings. But it'll take a decade or more for the probes to get out there in the first place. So that's not happening anytime really soon. Sometimes we can land on uh, uh, surfaces. Uh, we've landed on the moon of Titan around uh, Saturn. We've landed on some comets and some uh, asteroids as I mentioned before, but we're best known for landing on the moon and landing on Mars. We've sent probes and rovers to Mars, and they last for years and years and years. We have uh, the Curiosity rover on there now. We've had the Pathfinder, the Spirit Opportunity rovers. We've had other landers that just sort of landed there and took readings around the Viking landers in the 1970s. Uh, were like that as well. But they explore the surface in detail. Then we have sample return missions. We have one that's actually in operation right now. The OSIRIS-REx mission is going to asteroid Bennu. It's actually at the asteroid Bennu now. And it has this funky little device here. Remember I told you that when the Philae lander landed on the comet cheryumov garamasinko see I say that a lot so I can remember how to pronounce it, it bounced well, we learned from that, so we actually have this spring-loaded. So when it lands, sort of, what it does is it bounces off. But when it lands, it triggers something underneath here that then vacuums up the material that's on there. We call it regolith. It has dust and debris and rocks and other kinds of things. And what it's doing is it then bounces off and then it finds another spot and does the same thing and finds another spot and does the same thing. This little capsule in the bottom here is where the material will be collected. And well, actually, it may be this front piece here. 
but but uh, it will be in this piece. It's one of those two. I can't remember which one it is. Uh, but this will then detach and come back to Earth and give us samples of asteroid Bennu. And uh, it's it's an interesting thing to do. We've had sample return missions from the moon, including the Apollo missions. Uh, the moon landings with the astronauts brought back rocks for, from each and every mission. Hayabusa, which is from the JAXA Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, has also done this. We've also gotten samples from comet, sort of going through a comet tail. So, so those are interesting kinds of things too. Uh, so those are the uh, pieces of information for chapter seven. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and we'll be back for chapter eight, so stay tuned.